Well, I see a lot of people who I've known for many, many years in this audience. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be back here. I've already given this speech once, um, so it's, I hope uh, those of you who heard it the first time won't remember it all so that uh, you can profit by this uh, lecture as well. I don't quite know why um, I have been blessed with Ed Johnson. Um, he was a student at McAllister and, and one of my students. And uh, usually these students graduate and leave the country. But Ed graduated and moved to West 7th. So uh, he and I have had a long, long, long uh, relationship with each other. And uh, it's that relationship that's brought me here tonight. The goal of my talking uh, tonight is really to try to summarize and encapsulate the sort of thing that it's possible to happen in a city. I have, as you heard, I've, I've traveled a lot, visited a lot of cities, talked to a lot of urban planners, and tried to understand the, the dynamics that shape contemporary uh, cities uh, in the mid-latitudes. I've not studied tropical cities. And many of them, I'm sure you've all been to these places, have become hollowed out. The, uh, the notion that the central business district and the inner neighborhoods were dynamic engines of urban growth and the growth in the center pushed urbanization out to the fringe was the dominant thought in the United States and around the world for, for most of the 20th century. But now we see places like Chicago or St. Louis or Cleveland or Toledo or Pittsburgh or Newark, Chicago, Kansas City, that have huge empty areas in their centers. We don't. And I have been trying to find an explanation for why so far, anyway, uh, St. Paul and our, our neighbor to the west have been able to maintain a uh, community that is still actually growing, but uh, stable and, and growing. So I'm going to talk tonight about the concept of progress and the question of who's benefiting from progress and how do we think about individuals working together in um, informal or semi-formal or grassroots organizations and what role do they have in the shaping of the urban future of the United States. All right, I am from the college, so I have to start here on an academic note, going back to the Reformation. But since the Reformation, the, the major motif in Western European culture and North American culture is this concept of progress, that things are always supposed to get better. And we work toward that constant improving and the, you know, the assumption that you know, progress will solve all the current problems if we just continue to work forward. And it's certainly been a major theme in our state this is, of course, the quadriga from the south facade of the state capitol. The title of this statue is Progress of the State. And the horses are earth, fire, wind, and water. And they pull the chariot with civilization, the female figure, and prosperity, the male figure, forward into the future. Now you can think of this as the frontier mentality, all kinds of terms have been placed on this, but it's really deeper than just the American frontier. It's this concept that we are moving towards something in the future and that new is good and frequently old is to be discarded or at least greatly modified. Well, when I think about progress, the first thing that pops up in my, in my mind is who is getting the benefit from progress? Progress for who? And we've got these dy uh, dynamic tensions between parts of the city. 
the community, the residential community versus the downtown commercial and industrial interest, inner cities versus suburbs, landowners versus tenants, wealthy versus low income, and old residents versus immigrants. Now these are not always in direct conflict with each other. They don't necessarily mean they're fighting with each other, but sometimes progress for the suburbs means problem for the inner city. Now, we were built, this city I should say, was built very quickly. And it was built on the backbone of the streetcar developers, the real estate giants, Lowry and his associates, Minaj and others, King, who saw the city as a giant real estate development scheme. And the streetcar system was their loss leader that made their land accessible to places for employment. And so by building out the streetcar system, they brought progress to the city, the modern technology. But of course, that modern technology accrued great benefits for them and maybe not so many benefits for other people. The dominant thinking about industrial cities is summarized in this model of urban growth, sometimes called the Chicago School of Urban Sociology. But it's basically this notion I, I touched on earlier, where you have the downtown, the loop in this case, because it's done in Chicago, so they use Chicago's terminology. So the growth in the inner ring pushes on the second ring. The second ring then loses functions, loses space to the first ring. It expands into the third ring, and the third ring into the fourth, and the fourth into the fifth. An evolutionary model, like humans evolved and got superior to all the animals. That concept of evolution and progress was taken right into urban thought, and this model developed, sometimes called the invasion and succession model. So this group controls the destiny of everybody else by pushing outward from the center. Associated with that idea is another one called natural areas, where sociologists and geographers went out into the city and mapped it into areas that they thought were produced by the natural process of urban growth or urban expansion. So here's St. Paul, here's our central business district, and industrial, the warehouse, slums, of course this is that second ring, <coughs> slums around the, the downtown, then the third ring, the working men's homes, the Gold Coast here. Now, the Twin Cities and other cities don't really match that nice ring pattern that Chicago has because we're not flat. So we have more wedges than rings. But again, the basic idea here is that each of these land use areas competes with the others. And one will invade and replace the others. And the model says there are always going to be places of abandonment or places where the lowest, lowest income populations live. And in our case, the Levy community here, which flooded, the Swede Hollow community over here, which uh, was settled by squatters, and then the West Side community here, which also flooded. So we've got this complicated pattern of, of specific land use, but the theory is that, you know, progress will eventually replace all these um, low income and uh, somewhat dilapidated communities. In the 1920s, people realized that this model, this process of, of, of progress was actually hurting the middle class community because the wealthy could move out and move to newer uh, communities, newer spaces, but the middle class couldn't. So th 
zoning was developed to protect the middle class neighborhoods from the invasion by these other land uses. It was done with the police power. So the idea here is that zoning is a way to keep people in the cities healthier. Now, obviously, it has another purpose, and that is to protect neighborhoods from change. And what they did in the 1920s when they instituted zoning was very important. They took away people's rights to develop their property without paying them. Okay, so if you had property right there, you couldn't put that into commercial land use because you were not zoned commercial. A hugely controversial idea challenged in the Supreme Court of the United States and the justices said, yes, that's legal as long as you have a comprehensive, democratically achieved plan that lies behind the zoning ordinance. So now you see what's shaping up. Now we have a political process put in place where various elements in the community can compete or compromise for the stability and progress of the city. Okay, so now we've got a forum, not just some ideas in the academics' minds, but an actual forum. So let's see what happens. By the 1970s, planning had progressed quite a bit, and uh, people who were observing the planning process came up with this so-called ladder of community participation or citizen power. And you notice it starts at the bottom with manipulation, where the powerful come in and tell people what they're going to do to their neighborhood. A little bit later, there's a, we'll do something to you, and then we'll give you a little help afterwards. And then this one, tokenism. We're going to tell you what we're going to do before we're going to do it. Consultation is we're going to talk to you a little bit, and then we're going to do it. Placation is we're going to listen to your arguments, and we'll try to make, make this as uh, palatable to you as possible. That's the tokenism group. And then there's partnership, where the citizen group and the agent of change work together in some kind of partnership. Here, the powerful groups have delegated power to the community. And finally, the eighth step, the community, the citizens are in control. Now, this is a goal, right? not a status quo. It's a goal to have citizen control. So you can think about the history of your community and think about this ladder. What would, uh, what event that in the happened in the community that you could think of would fit in this lowest category here, manipulation? I-94. I-94, 35E, right? The federal government comes in, puts it through. Do you have anything going on now? That fits into this ladder? Well, we, you heard about it when we started out here, right? Working with the city on the fire station? Okay, that's partnership. Uh, maybe down here with the light rail. I, I don't know exactly how you are working with the light rail. But the, what I want you to see here is that this concept of progress that I've sketched out here, progress means citizen control. If I was another sort of individual, I might have a different goal here. Rather than citizen control, I want, may want to make my own master plan and develop my own community and create my own houses and sell them and then just invite people to buy. Okay, with me so far? All right. So, yeah, go ahead. I'm just having a bit of a problem with citizen control, given 
lot of citizens do not have the public good as a... Ah, very good question. She said that citizen control is kind of a, can be a problem because sometimes citizens don't have the best interests of the community at heart. This really means community control rather than individual citizen control. It's like urban planning differs from other sorts of planning because urban planning is planning for the greater good of the whole community. Everybody makes plans, but they're not all for the greater community. Okay, this process of urbanization went along. All the people looked at it carefully. Um, it became pretty clear that it wasn't working for everybody, that this great progress, this great set of cities that were developing in North America were not providing adequate housing for many of the citizens of the city. So in 36, um, well, first of all, uh, Carol Aronovich was hired by the Wilder Foundation to look at what was going on in the city, and she came back with a real scathing review of the conditions in the city. Then in 36, Fortune magazine publicized to the nation that St. Paul's slums were the, among the worst in the land. And these are illustrations out of that issue of Fortune magazine, the capital, capital approach and then the Summit Avenue and Cathedral. Well, this was very embarrassing. And you can imagine what the city leaders did. They argued with Fortune magazine and said, well, if you think we're bad, you should go over to Minneapolis and see what's going on over there. That sort of initial denial occurred at a time when the city really couldn't do much. But um, after it came out, they did decide that these conditions around the state capitol probably were too bad and we sh that sh something should be done. And so they recommended that that area be cleared, but then of course the war came and not much could happen. So here's a nice old air photo of, this, of the inner city of St. Paul. Here's the capitol. Been some clearing now, see, for the capitol approach in here, but it hadn't been finished. Here's the cathedral down here. And again, you see how tightly everything is built up with the exception of the hill here. The old, this is the old science museum here, Miriam's mansion. So that, that was a continuation of Summit Avenue that kind of ran like that. Here's the market over here, some other, these loft buildings and churches and so on. Here's Landmark Center down here in the St. Paul Auditorium. Uh, the academics nicknamed this era the Brown Decades. People were burning coal, there's a lot of pollution in the air, and it was a difficult time to be around. And progress meant something different. So let's start to clear away that low income area around the capital, those uh, cold water flats, single room occupancy places, tear it all down and put it into grass. Progress. What happened to those people who were living there? They were rehoused in the private slums elsewhere. Okay? So now they started to think about the downtown, and the downtown um, landowners and, and merchants were concerned about the future of downtown because you know, it hadn't really been growing as fast as they wanted it to. So they hired one of the geniuses of American culture, Raymond Lowy the guy who invented all this sort of design, invented the streamlined locomotive, and remember these cars? Studebaker. Studebaker, these fabulous cars, but invented that notion of streamlining, the Zippo lighter, all these things. So he decided to take on cities, and his plan was to make the city beautiful, lay it out nicely so you could easily find your way around, put in some new facilities, a convention hotel, parking garages, skyways, and a big multi-story apartment unit on Kellogg. And then go in and give all those old buildings a facelift. Progress for the downtown community. So here's the old Emporium. And there it is after Lowy got finished with it. 
See, what he did was just come in and put a facade around it, and the assumption was that would solve the problems of the inner city. After that happened, the move out to the neighborhoods. Okay, we got the capital cleaned up. We've got the downtown spiffed up. We're not to totally spiffed up, but we're working on it. Let's go out to the neighborhoods and let's clear cut. So this whole area in here, now called the Rondo neighborhood, cleared away to make way for the freeway and also to rehouse the population that was there. Okay, as I've indicated here, it was a test for the powers of preservation versus modern progress. Okay. Yeah, John. Was, was there ever any discussion at that time about locating 94 back on the parallel with the railroad track? Yes, lots of discussion. The, the city planner, a guy named George Harold, absolutely went berserk about this plan and argued and argued and argued that it should go north of the capital and there should not be this barrier between the cathedral, I mean the capital and the downtown. But he was totally overruled by the federal highway construction. So we've got that same ladder of participation here, but now it's kind of jacked up a little bit. Progress for who? progress for people moving long distances and, and the commuters. So David, were there any civic leaders that bought into that argument or was it just kind of a hollow, uh, you know, just kind of a fruitless uh, pursuit with the Fed? With Harold? Yeah, it was, a, it was a, a fruitless pursuit with the Feds. They were going on models that had the lowest cost possible and the and the so-called most direct route. But those of us who have driven 94 know that you can't drive freeway speeds on 94 because of all those curves that they had to put in it to get it through this little narrow area here. But the city council embraced this plan wholeheartedly. Now, uh, to shift a little bit, in addition to these houses that were issues, there were the old commercial strips. And that, this clearing here displaced hundreds and hundreds of African-American families. They asked that they be allowed to stay in their houses as long as possible. They asked for a fair price for their property. They asked that the freeway be depressed as it went through the neighborhood. And they asked for an open housing law. The city said, yes, you can stay in the houses as long as until we're ready to tear them down. We'll give you a market rate. We're not going to depress it. But then one of the city planners buddies from Detroit said, you don't want to have an elevated freeway. Depress it. So it was depressed, but not because of the community's request. And the city council refused in public debate to have an open housing law. Now the result then was the limited option for the African American population, the crowding into the neighborhood that was already there, and across the country, these crowded African American communities rose up in the 1960s and vented their anger, not at the city government, not at the federal government, but at the merchants in their neighborhood. And so they attacked the commercial strips. And people left as fast as they could. The so-called white flight. So we have clearing. We have some violence. We have abandoned buildings. And we have people leaving. So I've got some numbers here. You can read them. Clearing was active to get rid of the abandoned, vacant and abandoned houses. But we have to remember that progress for he in this area was not affecting the African American community. It was progress for other folks and they were paying the cost. So you see that decline in the Hill District's population. The city lost 1%, but the Hill District lost 15% of its population. Now, other things are working. 
The state decided that it was going to close down the large mental health hospitals in the rural parts of the state and implement something called community treatment facilities where houses would be set up in the communities, patients would come in, live in a community and get the support from the area around it. Well, those entrepreneurs needed big properties. Big properties were located in the inner city. So they moved into these older neighborhoods to buy the cheap houses and set up halfway houses or community treatment facilities. In this one, this is Jacobson's ho Jacobson House. These three structures were all painted this yellow color and they were essentially a little campus for uh, patients needing mental assistance. In violation of the concept of community treatment facilities. So eventually the city was able, and the state was able to pass a law spacing these functions out in a neighborhood. And then start in this bigger process of what are we gonna do about this hole we've made in the city? Right, we've cleared this all out, what will go into it? And interesting discussions were had about preservation rehabilitation versus new construction. And the city came up with a multiple prong strategy, new construction in here and historic preservation down in here. These commercial strips are problematic. They had a really important function during the streetcar era. With the change to automotive transportation, their logic disappeared and the people who needed accessibility moved out of the community. And this old pattern of uh, commercial strips, like this one, nice built up here, this is your, your street, um, with people walking to places to shop and uh, eat in restaurants and so on and services on the street, that changed. And I want you to see the two pictures here, the busy, storefront here, lots of entrances, lots of windows, lots of ways in and out versus this. These folks didn't have to be on the street. The street, they were there because it was inexpensive places. So they were serving the community rather than the local neighborhood and you got a different sort of street uh, scape, a different sort of image for their community. So people moved out um, land use changed and the future of the streets became a big question. Okay, it's the early 1970s, 50 years ago. A huge change, a huge change hit the U.S. culture. The Vietnam War was winding down. People were concerned about healing the wounds of the Vietnam era, trying to find something to pull the Americans <coughs> together. The Bicentennial Commission or celebration was coming and Bicentennial Commissions were set up across the country. And historic preservation was seized as a strategy not only to preserve pieces of the urban landscape, to promote investment in the city, but also give the, the country something positive. <coughs> Let's celebrate the revolution. Let's celebrate our glorious birth of a, as a nation instead of the divisions of the Vietnam War. So HRA sees what's now Irvine Park as another area to clear out, to tear down and rebuild. So we've got progress coming in that traditional way with a new progress coming against it, the historic preservation and the various societies decided, no, Irvine Park is historic. It should not be destroyed. You've torn down enough. We want it made into a, a historic district. Well, they had this battle and the result was the federal government stopped the funds that were, were earmarked for renewal here until something, some kind of compromise, some kind of strategy could be worked out. Um, here's the, the history and of course your organization was born during this period. So you, you know, your, your organization didn't start the Irvine Park but 
the birth of the organization is coincidental, and the Federation moved in to fill the gap within the political structure. The HRA had a citizens committee that would basically go along with what the HRA leadership wanted, and they were phased out, and the Federation moved into that role. So you see this moving up the ladder of the citizens of West 7th. And you all know the area here, I don't need to describe it to you, but it was selective dis uh, demolition occurred, housing moved in, housing restoration occurred, and you know, a beautiful part of the city was created. Now it's important to step back and think about that. That happened a long time ago. Now people think historic preservation is obvious. Why would you ever tear down beautiful old buildings like this? But that wasn't the case 50 years ago. And that the success of that switch in uh, culture made it possible for the Federation to begin the, to begin the process of creating a mixed income community. Okay. Zoning and all those other processes worked to separate neighborhoods out into homogeneous groups by income. The Federation started out on a mission to create a mixed income neighborhood. Now not everybody's going to live right next to each other, but in the confines of the organizational space, there would be a mix of income. So a group of people, I don't know their names, got this grant, $5,000, which was a lot of money in 1973, actually. Uh, it doesn't seem like a lot now, but a long time ago, that was a big chunk of funds. And off they got going, and off they go. So that the uh, words here, maintain and improve the quality of life in their neighborhoods and help the commercial endeavors prosper. So instead of going on this divide between residential and commercial, the Federation starts to try to integrate income in the residential areas and commercial development with residential. It's a funny neighborhood. It's a funny neighborhood. Uh, it's got a sharp edge on this side with the bluff on the Mississippi. It's got a sharp edge on this side with another bluff. So it's kind of, it's not a really a valley, but it's a step. Well, it's an old glacial terrace, but that, those terms don't mean, aren't very important. So it's this long, narrow, sharply bounded, mixed use area of the city. You remember on those first natural area map I showed you, it was all working men's homes. That's how it was classed back in the 1930s. Well, okay, so we're going to start to engage, or you're going to start to engage local leadership and make them active and get some concepts going here of conservation and reuse. So, yeah, not make a museum, but make, save what's good and find reuses for things. John? David, I think one other really important force was the bicentennial in focusing on history. Yeah. Yeah, you that. And of course, you know, Landmark Center was done by the Ramsey County Bicentennial Commission, so that's a big part of it. Um, yeah. As you were talking about the residential treatment facilities that were closing down, another force, and you may have alluded to this, but HUD had what they called intensive treatment right. areas, which is that therapy run of the right. <laughs> and I was like, we're going to look at these, these blocks and treat them intensively which meant clear them out and and they weren't dealing with the relationship of the residential to the commercial to the school population the faith communities exactly again you probably remember that uh, this is the era of the prominence of engineering in our society the moonshot had occurred if we can put a person on the moon, we can do anything. Controlled data could come in and rebuild cities for you with urban ventures. There's this whole notion that you could do social science surgery on the city. Instead of trying to you know, heal things, you could just cut it out and start over again. Well, I pulled out some things here that strike me as significant in your history. In a sense, I, I, I don't know if I've captured this exactly the way you would say this, but uh, 
in order for a community to be successful for neighborhoods, it has to have a comfortable ambience, but there also has to be commercial and work within the community. So the, the Federation broke ranks with other community organizations. Instead of just being a gadfly community organizing group pushing the city hall, you also took the economic development function into that same organization. Many cities had both functions, but they were separate and they'd break into rivalries. So you, you people did this in one move. And you took on one of the real issues of urban life in the 20th century, uh, vice, criminal behavior. I've just summarized it here as prostitution and pornography because that was the most visible thing that you took on. But you basically took on that underworld if you remember that diagram of Chicago, the underworld is in that zone. And your community took on that. Then you promoted commercial development. And you resisted change from the outside. Lots of things, lots of things impinge on communities from the outside. And you resisted those as best you could. And then, of course, you, just, you took this path of reusing buildings. Now, you weren't always successful. And uh, you all, I don't need to rub salt in this wound here for you, but um, it was kind of too late. You know, the deed had been done. So basically all the community could do was try to mitigate, again, if you think of that ladder of uh, communication. Um, and then you had to do something that I find quite interesting. This, and I know I'm kind of stretching reality here a little bit. Um, but you had to get respect for your neighborhood. And respect for a neighborhood is hard to get. And I picked up this example because it's, it's so dramatic. People coming in to the edge of your neighborhood and throwing their trash in your neighborhood. So basically, the most disrespectful act they could do. So the neighborhood has to kind of take on that sort of cultural bias toward lower income neighborhoods or inner city neighborhoods. So that was an interesting thing. And then of course, all the meetings that you went to. But look at, your, look at the issues. Now this is 93, but look at the issues. Zoning, pornography, crime, gangs, property values. All those issues that we can lump under progress for some and not progress for others. I love the color. And then, of course, there's these famous things that, you, you, that happened here. The battle with the prostitution providers, the, the, the battle with the obvious, if you can think of crime as kind of an iceberg, the obvious tip of the iceberg is prostitution and pornography. A lot of other crime is hidden from view. So you took on that and, uh, you know, you won. And, and what this, this was, of course, the people took some, paid the price for this, but what you did was push the community, you pushed back against an outside force, so progress for you, and you pushed on the city to make it work for you. And again, the, you know that story, I don't need to tell it to you in, in great detail, but it is, um, looking back at it, it's not without humor uh, to think of sitting down and talking to somebody. You know, it sounds pretty innocuous, right? Um, but this wonderful sign here, anybody else lately using this kind of technique? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not exclusive to the West 7th community. <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, the city council got in the act and found a way to get around all these issues. But I said, it's not without humor. This, of course, is from the Minneapolis paper, so you'd expect them to be a little smart alecky. <laughs> um, but anyway, it says, if, if you can't read it, before I get into all that, I, you'll have to know a little about what makes a man go into the sheet metal business to begin with. And I love the way Gwyndon has drawn these women. 
they're so bored with it all. I don't know that they actually you know, were that looked like this, but I just, um, anyway, there are the rates, half hour. But the important thing is that that was a very visible guerrilla warfare, so to speak, but it came uh, with some resistance. And I'll, I'll read this uh, to you, because I know you can't read it. Uh, this is about relocating. This is an old match, an old problem here where Ed and Dave uh, got into an argument about relocating Blazel's bar. And uh, so they give you all the things that uh, indicate that he, uh, you know, he says he runs a dirty strip show. But then they counter that argument with he is a great man, he was a pro football player, lost his eye sight helping a lady. Uh, Gave his going business of 30 years, and so he could build a trade, so he could be the trade set. So, kind of arguing with this. And then he gets on about Carlone. So, Ed and Dave are kind of criticizing Carlone. So, he says uh, Mr. Pe Carlone and his family could hold a liquor license. They said he had a dope pusher and everything else. Well, the argument then. Uh, Carlone's family have been living on the West 7th for 85 years. They won a medal in boxing in St. Paul, a medal in boxing in the 5th Army, a medal in weightlifting, and 20 years ago, Carloni was in jail for six months. Big deal. <laughs> and then, they're great people. Now, as you know, these processes in neighborhoods are personal. You know, it's not just arguing with some candidate running for office. It's somebody down the street. <laughs> and of course you didn't know this, or you may have forgotten that Dave and Ed were run out of their hometown. They've been here for less than 10 years. They dodged the draft. $80,000 of a year. They want credit for closing Raquel's rap. They have credit for all the rapes in St. Paul. Pretty vicious statement. Libelous statement, all that sort of thing. But again, the point here is that in order to have a successful community, there are very tough fights that have to be won. Uh, we'll go on and on about this. Um, well, I, this is too good to pass up. <laughs> so anyway, he's going on here about money available and com commercial business owners. Getting, you're getting new sidewalks and trees and lights and the iron fence. At the same time, taxpayers go without food and warm shelter. Think, Jesus Christ was born in the major because the leaders were MFs. Now, you know what MF means if you're an MF. But down here it means misfits. It doesn't really mean what you think it means. Okay. So then comes the more gentle fighting about the future of buildings and whose vision of the city will prevail. Uh, the plan here was to tear all this down in the grocery store next to it and, and build a strip mall, a nice efficient thing. And again, the same kind of fight going on. Can you find a reuse for this building? The Czech population has moved out. Can you, can you come up with a strategy that'll make this building work? And then coming back to our don't tread on me signs, which you don't have, but you should adopt that flag for yours. Uh, get some signs, some Fort Road signs and streets up, street signs up. I have to tell you a story about Grand Avenue. I was on the Grand Avenue Business Association and we decided we needed some kind of symbol. So we went out and bought flags to put on all the street lights up and down Grand Avenue. And the installers went along putting up the flags and two blocks behind them came a group of vandals, stole every flag <laughs> off Grand Avenue. I have no idea where they went. I've never seen them on eBay. I assume they're in some uh, dormitory at an unnamed St. <laughs> Paul College, now a university. Okay, then getting people to know the neighborhood, do tour books. This is the one's done by Old Town Restorations and there are tours in here about West 7th. And then working with the city. So you have this battle with the city over the enforcement of the laws on prostitution and pornography. 
move into a, a, a more uh, collaborative relationship with the city and achieve a really remarkable thing, a UDAG, Urban Development Action Grant, from the federal government for a neighborhood rather than for downtown. And as far as I've been able to determine, that was the first UDAG given for a project outside of downtown. So again, kind of moving up the ladder. And, you know, had a lot of, made a lot of positive change. And of course, the big thing was this building here, which uh, the medical offices, which provided the private match for the UDAG. But progress, okay, now West Seventh is making some progress for itself. What's the cost? All these things going on. So Ed uh, had asked me to come down and with some students and do a series of studies to see what happened to the people who were displaced by all the change that the neighborhood was creating. And this was a hard uh, thing to do. There are a couple of stories that I tell around the country about this study. I had read that uh, so, uh, social scientists were always taking advantage of community people by asking them questionnaires and not giving them anything back. So I had this great idea. We went and got a whole bunch of Susan B. Anthony's silver dollars, taped them on an index card, put them in the letter with a questionnaire saying, you know, we appreciate your time, have a cup of coffee on us. I can't remember how many of these things we sent out, I think 300. About 20 came back, giving us back the dollar. And I thought, Who's, who gives back a dollar? Maybe they didn't like Susan B. Anthony. I have to re think of that as an option. But they were so committed to the community that they gave back the dollar. Okay. But things are changing. So the Holman Olson company wants to move out. A site becomes available. The Confederation was able to move because of this development function, was able to move into this opportunity and create progress for one section of your community. Okay, and then, you know, there are lots of, there are lots of things um, that people have, have done over these years. One of them, here's Becky Yost right there. Um, something about Notification, you know, don't just come in and do things. Oh, is this the least of all? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And then, because of your activity in all this public uh, activity, private money flowed in, and maybe trickled would be the word, but money, private money came in, and this, you know, Ms. Anderson took over this abandoned building and converted it into market rate housing. But probably your biggest success as an organization was Brewery Town and the fight over not just a handful of residential treatment centers, but a basic campus of residential treatment centers that really violated all these things I mentioned before. And, you know, Hillman Holmes, the, the agent that was doing this. Um, so we had this phrase that came out of that, a mental health ghetto. Basically, that's what it was. Packing people into a neighborhood, small neighborhood, with deteriorating housing. So and again, spirit of the law, and eventually you were able to get that license. So the city, the c county commissioners did not send people to this operation. Okay? Lots to say here, but we don't have all a week. Then came not just throwing people out, but rebuilding the community, going into that Brewery Town neighborhood and tr tr create affordable housing for uh, lower income properties. And, you know, all kinds of things. Some houses were torn down, houses were moved around, houses were restored and new housing was constructed. Again, I want to keep hammering at this theme of diversity. Commercial, re, uh, residential, ownership, rental, new, old, all this was, has been part of the story here, this, this uh, patchwork or uh, weaving of this fabric. 
And then you have the 500 pound gorilla that's in your neighborhood. Right? Uh, what to do with the brewery. Now, the neighborhood, again, I don't have time to tell you the whole history in this context, but the neighborhood was really negatively impacted by deindustrialization. Lots of jobs were lost in this neighborhood. So, a series of businesses went into this great opportunity of the brewery and didn't really work out very well. And here's a picture of Ed just after he graduated from McAllister, well, <laughs> 20 years after he graduated from McAllister. But look, is this the Ed you know? Look at that dude with his tie and jacket on. Look at that. Anyway, you know, everybody knew that the brewery was either a great opportunity or an anchor that's going to pull the community down. I don't know if any of you have ever been to Detroit, but Detroit leadership did not tear down the automotive factories. So the Packard factory closed in 1953. A mile-long building stood vacant for 50 years. Huge blight on the region around it. So the question is what's going to happen? How, how can you get it you grasp at some straws here. I really don't think people want to drink organic water. Uh, but if it sells, uh, who am I to say, right? But there's no such thing as organic water. Okay, so big plans for the big opportunity here. And fortunately, after going through several false starts, Again, a partnership was created between the Federation, the city government, and the private development sector, and funding from a whole range of sources. So a solution was found, and I want to remind you of the other brewery in town, in a neighborhood with a similar history that has a very different impact on its neighborhood. And I've never been in there, but I, there's a nice picture anyway. And then building some new housing, new construction around it. Again, I want to keep hammering this point. New and old, new and old, new and old. And then in the 2000, the little Bohemia, the same kind of project, the same kind of problem. Somebody from the outside coming in, becoming a, uh, a slum landlord, tinkering with the zoning law to uh, enable a higher population density to be put in the houses. Higher population density increases the wear and tear in the house, deterioration in that downward spiral that we see so often. So the Federation said, we'll buy them all from you. And the guy said, no. Um, and then a few years later, everything was foreclosed. So the Federation got a bunch. And again, you look at this, you look at these numbers, and you know, they're just numbers on a picture, but you, you know the neighborhood. You think 40 vacant houses in a small neighborhood. That's a huge, huge thing. And a million dollars, you know, it's a million dollars, but um, it's not that much money when you think of the city as a whole. And again, the Federation listened to the community instead of you know, just clearing everything out went into this mixture and again I, I think these have all been sold now and here's one picture to show you that it really is winter occasionally in West 7th it's not always springtime here um, okay so you have this thing you've created a sense of place through a variety of ways you've created a community spirit and the organization and that's that's the foundation the houses, the streets, all that sort of stuff is the result of having this organization and having a community spirit. So it's really people. I haven't showed you very few pictures of people, but it's really the residents of the area that work. Now, I'm going to give you some heavy duty urban geography. So sit back, relax. So we've looked for years to try to find a simple way to take the temperature of a city. Everybody's trying to emulate you know, the, the, the doctors, the tests of water quality and so on, trying to find an easy way to, to measure successful cities or the potential for success. 
The problem is there are lots of dimensions to a success, economic and social as indicated here. So I'm gonna show you a set of maps. I'm not gonna present this as a, uh, a simple measure of success, but just show you some evidence of what I think uh, the data tells us. Okay, so this is household size beginning in 1950. So this household size is between 2.7 and 3.6. Don't ask me why they got these numbers. But um, anyway, between 3 and 4, and then 2.1 to 2.6 and below 2. So the darker, the larger, the lighter, the smaller. So you can see in 1950, the, the neighbor, I'm going to switch to the bigger one. The neighborhood is rather homogeneous. Large households, larger households. Then some change starts to occur at the edge of the central business district. And the families have decided this probably isn't the great place. And then that expands down West 7th. And then by 1980, there isn't any area that's got the large house size, household size anymore. And then but when we come all the way up to 2010, the whole area is down below two, except this one set of block groups in the middle. Wow, that's a big change, okay? Big change in the average household size. David, it's happening nationally too. Yep. So it's, I mean, it seems like it's just being pushed out in those rings. That's exactly what's happened. This is, the, this is the evidence for the expanding ring out and household size across the country has declined everywhere except in new immigrant communities. Okay, so now we've got children. So this is just another way to look at household size. Now we don't have a number here. This, this map intrigues me because there are more children closer in in 1960 than further out. And then that switched and goes the way. And I don't know the answer to that. I haven't really, there's no way I can find out what happened, why, those, why that pattern of movement occurred. But again, you see the general pattern, fewer children. So you've got singles living by themselves and couples with no children or couples with one child. So you got that, all that thing, young people coming in without children, older people whose children have left, older people moving into to senior housing without children. So you got all kinds of dynamics here working on the children. And then you look at young people, people under five. It's basically the same pattern with some, with some twists in it. Now, without kids, the rationale for schools goes away. Now this is a problem for communities because we built in the 1920s a model of cities based on neighborhoods anchored by the neighborhood school. So when the neighborhood school goes away, there's that community center function that also leaves, and that's, that's a big issue. Yeah. It, it, it seemed to me that uh, some of these changes uh, corresponded or, or uh, occurred at the same time that about 15, 17 percent population was lost to 35 each. Uh, yes, some of it does, for sure. For sure. And there was an amplifying effect. That's particularly up here, I think. That narrow zone of the freeway pretty much cleared away. Okay, you don't, you don't see that as a big deal, I think. Uh, no, I think it's part of the story, but there's also the shifts in, in culture. So you've got people leaving, but then you, the people who stay have changed as well. And then elderly. Now this one, the elderly map is complicated because it reflects buildings. So people, developers came in, constructed housing for the elderly, brought elderly in and packed them. Now, that's not the right word. Concentrated them in a few locations. So again, we've got this interesting pattern here, but again, it's kind of counterintuitive because you have an increase in elderly and you know, also in, well, it's just, got, it's very complicated. But it, the pattern isn't simple, it keeps breaking apart 
And again, I'm pretty confident that this is because of the various developments that have been put in place rather than a general trend. Becky, do you have your hand? Well, just, that's a strict population. That's not households with an elderly right. person. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here's what you're all interested in. Have we achieved a mixed income neighborhood? Okay, so we start out here. These are dollars are all the same. These are $2,015. Okay, so it's a constant measure across time. And as you would expect, looking back 50 years, 60 years, um, the income pattern is going to be different. But I don't want you to look so much at that, but how the pattern within the neighborhood shifts and how the neighborhood begins to increase in income and then decrease in income. The same areas are going up from here to here and then down and then up and then down again. Okay, this is good because it shows that there's competition for properties and people are coming in and moving in. But as you can see, your, your, your media, the overall, the income has gone up about what, 10, 12%. Now you haven't got, I mean, here's the metro median is 68. This is still under the metro median. Okay, it's still not a high income neighborhood. It hasn't been gentrified. Okay, it's not Ramsey Hill. It's not Uptown in Minneapolis. It's not St. Anthony Park. So based on the maps, it looks, it looks like you have achieved the goal of a mixed income neighborhood. Now here's a map, a set of maps that's um, very, very uh, interesting and a little bit hard to parcel out. So overall in the city of St. Paul, we're about 50% owners, 50% renters. We used to be 70% owners and 30% renters. So there has been a major shift in our city um, to be more like other North American cities. We were exceptional in that high rate of, land, of home ownership. And people have argued that the housing collapse of the 21st century has broken people's uh, confidence about the future of the housing market, that property is always going to uh, go up. They tell us that the millennials want fewer things. They want to have more discretionary income and less fixed costs. Um, and of course, the neighborhood with the largest percentage of families with children has the largest rate of home ownership. So some of this is pretty predictable. The question is, is this millennial population going to continue to rent or will they shift into home ownership? And that's a question I don't know. I can't, I can't speculate on that. Um, but you can see um, 62 to 80 percent home ownership at one time in these areas and it's shifted. Now again, that reflects building senior housing by Shalom Homes. All these things reflect decisions made by developers in conjunction with, with the power and the leadership. This one is just too hard to figure out. It's the length of, of uh, residence. I used to think this was a really useful measure of neighborhood uh, strength but the pattern is so, uh, I'll say, erratic. Uh, I, I can't come up with a, an answer that kind of covers why you get these patterns of movement. I think in, in, in many areas, it's the reflection of the success of the neighborhood that people are coming into the neighborhood. And so that's why you're getting this lower number of people who have lived here longer. Um, but when we did those displacement studies years ago, I mean, we were running into people who were living in the houses they were born in. And uh, I think that's, you know, that's kind of changed. Okay, so as I've indicated here, uh, you know, there's no simple explanation for what goes on. There's no single cause. 
But clearly, the economic and demographic data show to me, at least, that your goal of a mixed income neighborhood is been, has been realized. Um, and I think this is important because other, the other futures for similar neighborhoods, okay, if you go back 50 years and look at the neighborhoods that are like West 7th, what happened to the rest of the neighborhoods? They were either cleared or they became gentrified. They either became worse or they turned over into a new population. You have been able to skate between those two options and uh, you, know, you kind of defy the trends. Um, lots of things have been working against you. Um, and you kind of uh, fought back and um, came to some resolutions. But again, what I see as the difference here is this community organization that has been able to be so transformative. Not, and what I mean by that is that the population in the organization has changed. It's, some people have continued, but new people have, have come in. And again, I think you have that unusual ability to go out and develop property as an organization. You don't have to wait for other people to do it for you. So here's my definition. The community can create its own sense of place. It's not being described as by somebody else. There's lots of options in it. It has access to metro services and opportunities. It can move and it can engage its residents in meaningful actions, not just going to meetings. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Everybody looks hot and tired. Can we <laughs> questions? <laughs> questions? Yes, questions. I got one. It's not a question, but uh, you have to speak you, loud. If we're doing a history of uh, the Federation, a real early success of the Federation that is now a relevant issue now, is the Federation was singularly responsible for saving Riverside Playground. In the early 70s, there was a plan by the St. Paul Public Schools to take the playground and turn it into a big warehouse for central kitchen. They were going to have one place yeah. to cook the food and send it all. And the Federation was absolutely critical in not only stopping that absurd project, but then getting money and getting the city to commit to redo the playground, tennis boards, it's all beautiful. But the tragedy is now the city comes back and they're going to once again try to uh, and the Riverside Playground. But I mean, uh, I do think, because that goes way back in the 70s, and it was a success, it was a concrete success, that that should be blazed in the history of the Federation as one of the proud public <coughs> support. Hopefully, there will still be a Riverside Playground. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, that was a big success. The other obvious thing is, the city changes, so you have to keep responding. Um, if the city never changed, it would be one of the most horrible things possible. It'd be a museum. Yeah, it would be a museum. It would be kind of a science fiction place. It, it has to change. But the question is, how is it changing, and how are you able to get your desired future? That, that's what it's all about. It's not trying to save something just because it's here. It's what, you know, how, how, do we, how do we touch the future? How do we control what's going, that might, how do we impact what's going to happen in the future? You had a question. Thank you, Jerry Rothstein, the community reporter. Um, fascinating talk, and, I, and the old saying about learning from history is on my mind. What do we learn from your presentation? And of course we learned that kind of activity that a neighborhood organization uh, can um, can motivate and act through and succeed with a lot of the time most of the time depends on timing some of the stories from our past have been we were behind the curve some we were on the on the mark some we were perhaps a bit ahead of the curve 
Right now we have a critical issue for our neighborhood. The, the community reporter has been covering for two and a half years, every month, namely LRT on West 7th. And the question is, are we going to be timely or are, not, are we not going to be timely? Ourselves, the West 7th Business Association, we've been working to, now we'll be presenting 3,000 plus signatures on a petition to the Riverview study, Riverview corridor study. Mm -hmm. uh, 3,000, we don't want LRT. What's happening at those meetings, however, is I could ask Eric to tell you, it's like mind, it's like the lava lamp of the mind. <laughs> it's like every month there's new ridiculous ideas are floated because the old ridiculous ideas have gone nowhere. Well, let's have some new ridiculous ideas. But my point, of course, is we all have to get stronger to stand up to that because they can sneak it. They can still get it through. Now, I wanted you to say, what about timing? <laughs> Well, uh, since I'm not a historian, I have to say that space is more important than time. Location is the critical factor. Eric uh, promised to go out on the street and lie down before the bulldozers. <laughs> <laughs> that has worked. Um, Might have to do it. I just was, as you were talking, I was thinking of how Dakota County has come up and said, we're pulling out of the mass transit plan. And that's the first major break I've seen in the metro-wide process of, of transportation. Doesn't mean, it means they're pulling out. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be any, that you'll have to stop arguing about the LRT. But I just want to say that in the sense of timing, people are beginning to question in, in significant ways the metro transit plan. I'm, I'm not able to predict the future of light rail transit. Just one more, one more thing about the, the ladder. Sometimes it feels like the ladder is more like a, a circular kind of thing. And the bottom rung, which is like uh, throwing peanuts to the geese or something, comes around to the top rung where we say it's community involvement and power but they're very sophisticated in building these so-called community involvement systems. And so are you sophisticated too. You know, it's not like you're in your first rodeo to, phrase, to use a phrase from South St. Paul. I've been thrown off many times. Um, in, in regard to the, the diversity notion, um, I, I, I remember when, when the Federation uh, uh, consciously try, decided to tr uh, try to hang on to or, or develop the economic diversity. I, 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 I think it's, it's interesting to note that it was, it was here. Um, you, you can see it, not necessarily in the 70s, but before that, it was here. You, you can go down the streets and you can see the grand building next to the little building, next to the moderate building, and the, the, the diversity was here. I, I, I've been down here for over 40 years now, and I still feel like a newcomer, you know? Because you got all these families that have been here for three, four, five generations, and there is that continuity uh, underlying stability, it would seem, and every kind of diversity you can imagine, uh, economic, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, different social diversities, um, uh, ethnic uh, and ethnics coming and go. <coughs> I'm, and I, 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 I feel like we're, we're, and I agree there's been great success in a lot of it, facilitated by the Federation. But I, I don't feel like we're done. You know, how, how do we hang on to that diversity, particularly the economic diversity, 
and and um, uh, not not have all, all this uh, 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 wonderful success buried under gentrification. Any, any thoughts on that? I think it's probably asking a lot. But what do you think? I think the people who uh, worry about gentrification um, are kind of overreacting. Um, and I, I, you know, I, you know, again, I haven't looked at this neighborhood every year since the 1970s, but I've been watching it a long time. And when I came in to do those displacement studies, everybody was saying the suburbs are going to come back into the city we're going to have this back to the city movement the poor are going to be pushed out to the edge some have some things happened but summit hill isn't totally gentrified so i i don't i don't think that that's the kind of of um, tsunami that's going to wash over your neighborhood i think there'll be places in the neighborhood where people of higher incomes will move in. You, you have a housing stock that's very diverse. And some of those houses, unless they get on the small house program on TV, are not going to attract gentrifiers. They're too small. Um, so that it, it, you know, because you have had a diverse history, you should have a diverse future, unless you tear it all down and make it homogeneous. So I think the other thing, of course, is you have to be stubborn. You can't give up the fight because, as I said, change is constant. You, you can't stop doing what you're doing. It's a good argument for preservation. Yes, a, but you have, to, you have to preserve and persevere. Well, and I think that's what this story tells me, and having been involved since 74. Um, it's like owning a house and you, you, <laughs> you do one thing and it's like, oh my God, I have to repaint this room 15 yes. years later. So it never stops needing attention. But I do think we, we have a toolbox of ways to address issues. Like we continue to improve what, what might be called the social capital of the neighborhood, the involvement of people and working towards our goals. But we're constantly bombarded. It took 11 years from the time the neighborhood re responded to the environmental impact statement draft to have a great separated interchange at Chestnut and Shepherd. From the time we submitted our report back, you know, which was three inches thick, to when it was finally resolved, Shepherd was moved back. So there's a person, as you say, a perseverance, but also recognizing that the same old tactics may not work you know so going to meetings <laughs> it's like maybe it's time for something else and that treatment center in leach mcball i mean or the um brewery neighborhood the hillman homes those were tough issues for the neighborhood because we do care about people mm -hmm. and we knew he, who we were going to be displacing and so putting that into context and um hillman was a bit of a different thing but the leach mcball I mean, we just identified where all the board of directors of that non-profit non -profit lived, and none of them were in the neighborhood, let alone the city of St. Paul. And it's like, how dare you move um, chronic alcoholics for whom you're not going to provide any treatment program, you know, right. right in the middle of the neighborhood. Or um, picketing Ed Helfeld's house, the director of the HRA, or working with a senator who wasn't necessarily aligned with some of our political views, Senator Durenberger, so that we didn't have a four-lane high bridge when that got redeveloped. And, um, or with the school district, in addition to Riverside, there was just saving of Monroe, period. Um, so it's like the context changes, the times, and maybe the players are different, but really thinking about what's that end goal and how, what are the means we have to get there? So in, in many ways, the development of the, the Federation as an economic development uh, arm was a major strategy. And Joe Arago um, was the one that really pushed us to do that because he saw what could happen in, in neighborhoods when you did have those competing interests of the so-called citizen voice against the, you know, the economic realities. Some thoughts. Dave has a quick I just had a comment. Uh, 
you know, the, the history of the Federation, you know, going way back to the beginning, how West Seven at the time when the Federation was first formed had this really sense of being on the short end of everything, with the city, with the school district, the parks and rec. You know, we, we were fighting for survival. And we, we got shortchanged and everything, so there's a sense in the neighborhood that it was us against them. And that came out in a lot of issues. And as time went on, we've had more and more successes. And now, here we are sitting here now, we've got you know, all kinds of editorials, all kinds of articles about what's up with the success. As a Federation treasurer, it's harder and harder to get money to keep the thing going. Because people see us as a success, we're no longer willing to do the things maybe we did 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, or 30 years ago. And you know, there's people in the neighborhood that are very powerful. It's a different kind of neighborhood. And uh, we have to kind of think through that at the Federation level. How can we be more effective dealing with light rail, dealing with these different issues that come up? Because it's going to be almost tougher in a way than it was in the beginning. At the beginning, again, we had the sense that everybody was against us, and they were. And, and, and uh, we won a lot of battles, but it's much tougher now. <clears throat> we have a lot to be proud of, and with your help, we'll continue to move forward and, and continue to be progressive. Thank you, David, for your time. Your Thank you all for coming. Okay, thank you.